Hi, I'm Brad Brown with the IHSA. The video that we're going to be doing today and what we're going to be talking about is a variety of different rigging hardware that you're going to run into in the field. There's a huge variety of different rigging equipment that you can find and it's important that you understand some of the aspects to do with each of these. So today's video is only going to talk about a few of the more common ones that we find in the field. Now one of the most important things we have to look for when we look at any rigging hardware is to ensure that it's not counterfeit. There's been a huge boom and a big market in counterfeit rigging material. So when time we look at our things like our shackles, we look at our clips or anything that we're using, we want to make sure that they're authentic from a recognized manufacturer. Now, one of the more common things that we use in the field are what we call below the hook devices. Now, what below the hook devices are is something that changes the way that you're going to rig whatever the load is. Now, this can include things like spreader bars, lifter beams, various types of clamps, magnetic clamps. There's all sorts of different varieties out there. And again, these are designed to reduce the risk when making a lift of something that might be awkward shape, might be round, it might be large. So these devices are designed to help reduce the risk when making one of those lifts. Now one of the keys with using below the hook device is deciding which type of below the hook device you need or if you need a below the hook device at all. For example, you're going to want to use a spreader bar anytime when you need to lift something that's large and the attachment points are too far away to keep a good sling angle. We always want to keep our sling angles as large as possible so using a spreader bar increases the sling angle and then adds capacity to the rigging equipment. When a load can't be lifted safely using standard rigging methods, below the hook devices are often required. These are things that you're gonna to have to decide when you look at the type of things that you're going to be lifting most commonly. Below the hook devices have to be engineered. You can't make them in the shop and bring them out to the field. These are engineered devices. If you're going to use them to lift overhead, they have to have an engineer's mark on it. You want to make sure that all riggers and operators understand the proper care, use and inspection of these devices by following the manufacturer's instructions. Again, there's a large variety of these devices in the field and we want to make sure that we're following exactly what that manufacturer tells us we have to be doing with them. It's also important to develop standard operating procedures when using below the hook devices. That way, everybody understands the use of that piece of equipment on site. A very common device that we find in hoisting and rigging is the use of a hook. Hooks are going to be used in almost all of our hoisting operations in one way, shape or form, whether it's from the crane or lifting device or at the attachment points. Now when we look at our hooks, we have to make sure that they've got the working load limit stamped or cast on them. This has to be present for us to know what the capacity of that hook is. Now when we look at hooks, they're supposed to be loaded plumb center. They're designed to be loaded in this direction. At no point should we be loading our hook more than 45 degrees off plumb center because that puts us in a position of back loading or tip loading our hook which can damage the hook and perhaps cause catastrophic failure. They have to have a safety catch on them. With the exception of very few things in construction, they always have to have this safety catch in place. Now, when we want to inspect our hook, we want to check for any cracks or excessive wear over time. Metal will wear down, believe it or not. So we want to check for that excessive wear in any location. We want to check the throat opening on the hook to make sure that this distance is the same as it was when it came from the manufacturer. If we've had a situation where we've tip loaded or back loaded this hook, it can cause this throat opening to stretch and we have to take the hook out of service. We want to make sure that the hook is not twisted in any way. The hook has to be straight in its proper orientation as it came from the manufacturer. Sometimes under load this could rotate or we could side load our hook and that can cause this to twist out of center and then we have to take that hook out of service. Now of course as always we're going to refer to our manufacturer's instructions for our hooks and, and our lifting devices to ensure that we're doing exactly what the manufacturer tells us and using it in the way that they designed. Another very common device we're going to find in hoisting operations in the field is the use of shackles. Shackles are very, very common and they're used in many operations and applications to hook things up, but also very commonly to collect multiple slings into one place. Because again, remember, our hooks were not allowed to load at more than 45 degrees off center. 
So we often use shackles to collect the extra slings so that we can lift in a safe manner. Now, we also want to ensure that we're using the right type of shackle for our lifting operations. Certain types of shackles are only meant to be lifted directly over the center, such as ones that have the pin style with just a cotter pin on one side. Those cannot be loaded off to the side in any way. They must be loaded directly plumb center. More common in the field, you're gonna find the screw pin type like this one here, or the nut and bolt variety. Both of those ones are allowed to be loaded in sideways and over 45 degrees. However, there are gonna be marked reductions in the working load limit of the shackle when we do that. On most shackles, you will find the working load limit stamped and cast in here. It will often show you the 45 degree mark so that you can then understand how much reduction there is. For example, at 90 degrees, if I were to hook this, or excuse me, put my slings in here at 90 degrees, the working load limit of this shackle is reduced to 50% of its normal working load limit. The working load limit of our shackles has to be put on the shackle, it has to be cast or stamped in here. Now, we can load these in a variety of different directions and normally they will have the 45 degree mark marked on the shackle so we can see it. As we side load our shackles, the working load limit drops drastically. At 90 degrees off of plumb center, the working load limit of the shackle is reduced to 50% of its working load limit. Now, when using a screw pin style, which is of course very common in the field, we wanna make sure that it's seated properly. We wanna screw the pin all the way in. None of this all the way in and quarter turn back like we were taught in the field. It needs to be screwed in all the way for it to function to its proper working load limit because if we pull that back off a little bit, we're putting pressure on the threads instead. So we wanna make sure it's secured all the way in. Good tip, keep a wrench handy. If it tightens up, that way you can get it off. Now, when using any of our shackles, if any component is lost, say we lose part of this or we lose the screw pin, we don't get to just makeshift something and put it through here. No throwing rebar or pipe through and thinking that it's gonna work. You have to ensure that you're using the exact same components that belong with the shackle. Now, when we're looking at inspections for our shackles, we're going to inspect it for bending and twisting. We're gonna make sure that all of the cast in information is supposed to be on here. We wanna make sure that the pin and the bow are not stretched or damaged in any way. We're gonna check it for cracks, corrosion, pitting, rusting, any of the common signs of damage that we're used to. And of course, always refer back to the manufacturer's instructions for proper use, care, and inspection of these devices. Now, of course, these were just some of the devices that we use in the field. There are many, many other devices and pieces of equipment that we use in rigging operations out in the field. Things such as turnbuckles, eye bolts, and clips. These are all other common devices that we use. And you wanna make sure that everybody understands how to use those devices properly. Workers have to understand the proper use and care of these devices before they use them. Every single one of these is unique and has its own unique applications. So make sure you refer back to the operator's manual for these devices so that you're always following what the manufacturer's instructions tell you and how you're supposed to use them. Now, another good rule that we should use in the field as much as possible is to oversize your rigging whenever you can. Don't lift to the working load limit. Working load limits are set in the factory under ideal conditions with brand new pieces of gear and equipment. This is not the reality of construction. I haven't seen a brand new piece of anything on a site for a very, very long time. So we have to take that into account when we're planning any of our lifting operations. Thanks for watching our safety talk. I'm Brad Brown with the IHSA. Please visit our website at www.ihsa.ca for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more safety videos. Thank you.